I'm just a brief introduction because I didn't have this planned in my presentation, but after speaking with the mayor and the secretary of state yesterday, I realized that the way I came into smart cities is the way that it seems that Portugal and, and this region is coming to think about smart cities. In, uh, in uh, late 2008 or so, I started writing a book with this famous woman, Hunter Lovins, uh, because she wrote this book, Natural Capitalism, which was, is still to this day considered the Bible for green innovation and sustainability in the business context as well. And I convinced her to write the sequel to the book with me. That book we called Climate Capitalism, it was published in 2011. In that book, we try to explain through cases how cities and companies and governments around the world are actually profiting by making a commitment to the low carbon economy. So we have a whole chapter on energy efficiency, one on renewables, one on transportation, on agriculture, carbon markets, buildings. And uh, at that time, everyone in the world was super excited about the possibilities of uh, a global agreement with the United Nations Conference of the Parties, because we started writing this right before the 2009 event in Copenhagen, when the whole world thought Obama was going to come and save the planet, and we all know he didn't. And so I started getting really frustrated with the lack of progress around climate action at the national and international level, and I started looking around the world and saying, well, where is the opportunity to solve this problem? And I quickly realized that cities are the answer. Cities are the answer because they represent about 80% of the world's um, energy consumption and, and uh, emissions from uh, greenhouse gases. So they also are, as we all know and has been discussed earlier, there's a big trend in migration into, into city centers. And mayors, uh, even in smaller regions like this one, have a lot more authority and responsibility to make decisions at an at a urban territory scale and also, they're much closer to the voters, to the citizens, compared to other levels of government. So I became really interested in the idea of, of, of cities being part of the solution to the, the climate change crisis. That was part of the reason I came into the smart cities. Another one is I had a couple of my entrepreneurial ventures between 2005 and 2012. The two at the top particularly, well actually they all were green ventures. But the two at the top were actually really smart cities projects, but it was before we called them smart cities. The one on the right was called Visible Strategies. It was a software service that helped cities track and monitor their sustainability performance. And then the one on the left was a mobile app company we developed to uh, allow citizens traveling to or living in a city to find the nearest green businesses to where they were. And they could rate them and interact with them and, and choose to, uh, to invest or buy products and services from companies that shared their values. So the combination of all these things made me realize that cities were where I needed to look. So as uh, Victor mentioned, I'm a researcher as well. I'm an academic. I'm a professor and uh, director of innovation at a university in Chile right now, Universidad de Arroyo. And I study entrepreneurship, sustainability, and smart cities. That's really my job. So I spend my, my, I dedicate the majority of my life now to studying cities. I've also lived in a lot of cities. I've lived in De uh, Copenhagen and Madrid and Vancouver and Denver and Buenos Aires, and I now live in Santiago. And this immersion that I have from living in these cities really opens my eyes to what the opportunities are. It also allows me to interact with local politicians and citizens to understand how innovation is happening in different cities and to learn from failures and successes across the world. This study recently came out. It's very interesting. I know you can't read the details. It's not the point. It's, they did this. It's another kind of wheel. But they did this study. These authors up here, academics, did a study over the last 100 years. What are the ways people have been thinking about future cities? And just this part on the right, it's just one one part of their wheel, which is called city categories. And they have all these things, water city, connected city, cognitive city, smart city, all the way up. They don't have analytic city. That's a new one I don't think I've heard before today with your, uh, with your government. So I'm interested to hear more where they're going with that one. 
So smart city is just one of them, but we all know we've seen images of what people used to think it was going to be with flying cars and everything all technified and robots everywhere. And we haven't gotten there and we may never get to that vision. Smart cities is, is something that might uh, have a future. Uh, Richard Florida, some of you probably have heard of him. He's been very influential. He's one of the leading th uh, scholars and researchers in the idea of innovation in cities. His thing is, his whole sort of platform is really around how cities can uh, attract and retain the creative class by fostering a creative environment in urban areas. And actually, uh, I'll mention this later, but I'm working on, among another, uh, one of my research projects is a special issue in an academic journal called California Asthma Review. And we did this call for papers for submissions. And Richard uh, submitted a paper to us and his paper is his latest research, which he's going to turn into his next book. And it's uh, called The Rise of, the, of Startup Cities. Very interesting. You're the first people in public to hear about this, by the way, that I know of. Um, and it's, a, it's an extension of his existing work. But one of the things he's doing with this new research is studying the flow of investment capital into technology companies. And what he has found, which is probably not surprising to any of us, is that the old way of thinking of creating tech parks in isolated suburban areas is not really where it's happening anymore. Innovation is happening in cities. And investment is going into startups in cities, not into outside suburban areas. This is an interesting trend that's something to follow because it's certainly uh, going to continue in the same direction. More and more innovation entrepreneurship happening in cities. This is an uh, interesting uh, case, there's lots of these now, especially in Europe, of these sort of uh, regional or graphical areas that have decided to become self-sufficient. This is Samso Island off the coast of Denmark, but one of the things that's really interesting about them, so all of their renewable energy comes from, uh, well, all their energy comes from renewables. The citizens participated in investing in the renewable energy capacity for the region, for the island, and so they actually, the citizens, get a return on their investment with the sale of the energy. The energy is consumed not only on the island, but sold back to the mainland Denmark because they have excess capacity of renewable energy. So they're beyond 100%. There's other visions of things in the smart space. Uh, this project in Rio with IBM has gotten a lot of global attention. IBM has done a great job marketing it. And there's some real value behind this project, which is to create an operations center for Rio that has sensors and data streaming in real time so that anyone from the mayor to the fire chief can actually monitor data and react to it in real time. There's some really good success stories of how this has helped. For example, they have uh, humidity sensors in the hillsides in the favelas in Rio that allow them to predict when there could be a, a, a mudslide that historically resulted in a lot of death and injury to local residents in these poorer communities, and they're able to minimize the impact of that now with this kind of technology. But this kind of technology has also gotten a lot of critique. Uh, Anthony Townsend wrote a book, so this is kind of a book tour I'm giving you. So the great thing is, I'm going to talk about 12 books today, and you don't have to read any of them if you don't want. I'm going to give you enough summary that you at least know what they're supposed to be about. Uh, the authors probably aren't happy with me for saying that. But um, Anthony Townsend, very good scholar. Uh, he's in, based in New York, and he wrote this book that came out last year called Smart Cities. And one of the big things he does, uh, which is followed up by the next book I'm going to show, is criticize the very tech-centric, top-down thinking that a lot of the early stuff in smart cities was all about. And as we're hearing uh, throughout the day today, and Pablo mentioned for sure, uh, is that cities, smart cities are way more than about technology. In fact, they're about territory, they're about citizens. And how might technology be used as an enabling tool to improve the quality of life of citizens? Smart cities need to be, anything any city does, almost in any area, should have the end goal of improving quality of life. If it doesn't do that, it probably doesn't add value. 
This book, it just came out, and by the way, these authors also submitted a paper to our special issue that's going to go forward. And they actually, uh, they don't call it smart cities, but they're talking about smart cities. And they, they basically have three categories of cities. They call it a Petropolis, which is a very fossil fuel-based old way of thinking, lots of suburbs, lots of asphalt, lots of cars, uh, way of thinking of cities, which still exist today, unfortunately. Uh, then the second one they call suburbia, which is really how they think of smart cities. If you read the book, they're talking about suburbia being these very technology-centric, top-down managed cities. And then their third one, which you wouldn't be surprised by, is the one they're most uh, optimistic about, and that's the bottom-up approach, which is the idea of, of citizens engaging and planning in, in co-creation with the city to create a new form of city that's very engaged, that all people, whether they're young or old, whether they're high income or low income, no matter where they live in the city, feel involved and part of the city. And they're actually taking part in making decisions and planning and, and, and much more. I'm going to talk about that towards the end of the presentation. So uh, when I started looking at smart cities as a concept was around 2011. Most of the people talking about smart cities then were IBM and the tech companies. And I tried to understand what a smart city really was. Because nobody said the same thing. When you read a magazine or an article, it still happens today, of course. But this idea that a smart city is a technology city, it's an innovative city, it's a uh, participatory city, it's a sustainable city. I heard all of those things as what a smart city is. So I decided to start my own research project to understand more deeply what cities who were really moving forward with smart cities were actually doing. And as a result, I created this thing called the Smart Cities Wheel. Uh, I'm quite uh, honored that the wheel has become uh, a tool that's being used around the world. It's been translated into Swedish and Dutch and Hebrew, uh, Spanish, of course. I don't think Portuguese yet, but maybe with your Portuguese Smart Cities Council, we'll do that. That would be fun. So there's six components to the Smart Cities Wheel. Economy, government, people, living, mobility, and environment. Within the wheel, within each of those, there's three subcategories. And then the hard work beyond that is the indicator work that I've worked on with several other organizations and people to help me figure out how I could measure this in cities. It's a tool, it's a guiding tool for cities, for planners, for citizens to understand in one graphical image what a smart city is supposed to be about. It's much broader than technology, as you can see, at least in my definition. I mentioned the Smart Cities um, special issue of this California Management Review I'm working on. Uh, we have a, one of the world's lead, well, he is the leading scholar in, in the topic of open innovation, uh, Henry Chesborough. He, he's actually the father of the term open innovation. Uh, he wrote a book about that, of course, uh, in 2003, I think it was published. And, um, we're, we're applying this idea of open innovation into cities, and that's really what a lot of this is about. How are cities opening up with open data, with uh, participatory budgeting processing, with all kinds of tools and approaches? How are they creating a more open approach to innovation? Procurement for innovation is one that I really love that we'll talk about briefly as well as, a, as an interesting trend. Innovation districts are really interesting um, in innovation as well in cities that have, have emerged over the last 15, 20 years. Barcelona has probably got the longest standing one, at least it's very well recognized. Lots of startup companies in these innovation districts. I understand here in Barcanza there's actually a form of an innovation district in a particular building with a bunch of sustainable technology type companies uh, being invited to participate. That's an example of, a, of an innovation district. Uh, this this uh, paper research project came out very recently called The Rise of Innovation Districts. That's from, um, from the Brookings Institute in the U.S. And they study this evolution of how cities around the world, and particularly they were looking at the U.S., are dedicating physical territorial space to support the growth of entrepreneurial innovation ecosystems in their cities. And going back to what I said about Richard Florida, again, this is not tech park outside of the city. This is stuff in the city. It's a way to regenerate the city 
to create jobs in the city. And furthermore, one thing I'm really interested in is when cities take the next step and not just work to facilitate uh, these tech districts inside the city, but they also use the city as a platform, as a living laboratory to allow these entrepreneurial companies to test their technology on the city itself. That's a very important part that a lot of the uh, emerging cities are doing. Related to that point, one of my favorite smart cities projects right now that's j very new is this one. It's called AMS Institute in Amsterdam. It's a collaboration between several universities, four universities in Holland, in the Netherlands, the um, MIT from the US, the city of Amsterdam, and many corporations. And the goal is to co-create new innovations across major uh, ecological ecosystems in the city, particularly food systems, energy, water, and buildings, and use the city as a test bed to experiment with all these new innovations they're going to co-create. And then the best ideas, going back to Pablo's thing on urban diplomacy a little bit, is the idea of using Amsterdam to test these technologies and then build a brand for Amsterdam as sort of an exporter of the most innovative solutions for cities and then therefore uh, creating this sort of interconnected group of cities around the world that are using their technology from Amsterdam. Very cool project, just got off the ground. They have three or four interdisciplinary research projects they're working on right now, but they're just getting started. So then, this is sort of the present day. Where do I see the trends going? Spend my time researching this a lot, so I thought I would share some of my thoughts on where, where trends are going in the smart cities related arena. And I'm going to finish, as Victor mentioned, with a proposal to this region. So these are six key trends that I've observed. There's a lot more. If you were in uh, the Smart City Expo in Barcelona a few weeks ago, some of you probably were. Uh, you'd probably hear a hundred trends total if you listen to all the presentations. These are some that I'm paying attention to. Visioning and measurement. City of Vancouver, I lived there when they were doing this. Uh, it was a very interesting experiment. Over 30,000 citizens were engaged in a process to develop a plan for the future of the city. This was not top down. Remember the bottom up that we talked about? Uh, from the book uh, but with Blowfield, for example. The bottom-up way of planning is we're going to gradually, it's not in one big theater, but over a year we're going to meet with people in different places, online, offline, in, in, in events like this, and we're going to understand from them what do they want with our city. Where should we go? And this visioning part and measuring is very important, and I find not enough cities are doing either one of them right now. A lot, of the smart, a lot of the cities pursuing a smart city strategy, and I'm talking about some of the leading cities in the world, to this day don't have a very clear, tangible goal for 2030, 2040, or 2050. There's no way you can know what technologies you're going to be using then, but you could certainly create a, a north, an orientation. Where do we want to be? So what did Vancouver do with their citizens, figure out where they want to be in 2020? which isn't that far away now, but they started that process three or four years ago. And their goal that the citizens co-created was we want to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. Now, I don't think they're going to get there. They're close. Copenhagen's going to beat them, though. They're already ahead of them, and I don't think Vancouver's going to beat them. But they set a very ambitious goal with the citizens. And then, so that's the vision, and then measurement. They worked with the citizens to identify about 10 key target areas for improvement. Things like water, transportation, green space, green jobs. And so then they measured where they are today, or where they were when they created this vision, which was three or four years ago, and then they created goals for 2020. If we're going to be the greenest city in 2020, what would these measurements look like? in 15 years or so, 10 years. So one thing is figuring out your vision, which I absolutely believe has to be co-created with the citizens. 
Because one of the reasons it has to be co-created with the citizens is because if you don't do it that way, the mayor leaves, the next mayor comes in and they throw out the, the last plan because they want their new plan. They want their plan. But what happens is when you have 30,000 citizens agreeing to a vision for the city, you get a new mayor, you, the new mayor has to convince 30,000 plus citizens that all that work they did to create a plan together is not worth anything and it should be thrown in the trash. So it creates some consistency to the goal. And then this measurement thing is very important. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, as Victor mentioned, I've been for the last four years doing uh, smart cities rankings around the globe. So I do a regional ranking of Europe, North America, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. This is, these were results from Europe in 2012 um, using the smart cities wheel and a bunch of indicators. Now this year, I'll, I'll admit, I experimented and kind of failed. I had 62 indicators. I submitted these to the cities to di directly provide me data, and only 11 cities out of 120 cities in the world responded to my survey. The reason, they said, is it's too much work. 62 indicators was just a lot of work for cities, and for the most part, only the leading cities wanted to be, go through all this work. It's published in Fast Company. It came out about two weeks ago, if you want to see the results of that research. This I did in uh, Chile last year, which I understand the, your smart cities group in, in Portugal is doing as well. Uh, I measured 11 cities in Chile uh, using the smart cities wheel and the indicators associated. Um, and so each of these indicators is, is a summary score for each of the six categories of the smart cities wheel. And so this is where I think cities and countries and regions need to go as part of the process is measuring where they are so they know where their problems are and they can start to create a, a vision and a goal for where they want to be and measure their progress against that. So I, uh, we've all, we're all talking about the role of citizens in this process. I, you know, five years ago people were talking about the new thing for cities was to treat citizens like customers. So customers need to be uh, respected or they'll leave. Uh, you need to think of them as, as, as a, an important client for the city. And then we started moving towards more like, well, citizens should be more like participants, not just clients. They should participate with the city in developing plans, in thinking about the future. But now I think the next phase that's happening right now is citizens as co-creators. I've been studying this thing I call civic entrepreneurship, which are individual citizens living in cities using entrepreneurial action to solve city problems. It's not what we used to think about. We used to think it was a city's responsibility to solve citizen problems, but now citizens with technology, with the information they have, with their ability to um, collaborate with other people, with companies, with the government, are saying, no, we're not going to sit and wait for the city to solve all our problems. We're going to actually start to solve them ourselves. And many times they're trying to find ways to solve them at a profit, so creating real companies in this space. There's a lot of these. In fact, there are, I've been studying civic accelerators, so there are organizations around the world that have been developed either by governments or, not, or, or uh, private investors that are focused just on helping civic-oriented startups have success. One of the most impressive examples of citizen co-creation, in my opinion, is what they've done in Medellin. So I did a study uh, probably six months ago comparing the transformation of Singapore and Medellin. Two cities that over about 30 years went from developing world, suffering, crime, poverty, dirty, to radically transformed to leading cities in their region. Difference? Singapore, very top down. Probably you all know if you chew gum and put it on the, on the street in, uh, in Singapore, you might go to jail. Uh, and then the Medellin version was very bottom-up. They decided, we're going to attack the problems in the poorest communities in our city. And if we can do that with citizens involved, we can transform our city in a very important way. When you have a lot of inequality in a society, 
you encourage crime, you encourage um, disconnectivity between people with lower and higher incomes. So if you can raise the lower income people up, you're going to improve the quality of life of everybody. And that was basically the Medellin strategy, but they co-created new solutions for the poorer communities. This is their famous uh, Metro Cable, which is a, a, a funicular that goes from uh, the base of the city to the poorer neighborhoods in the hillsides. Very impressive project. Uh, they put the nicest library in the entire country of Colombia was put in one of the poorest neighborhoods in all of Colombia. That you don't see very often. Quality infrastructure in poor neighborhoods. Why is that so important? Yeah, it's amazing that local residents who are poor and normally don't have access to this kind of resources near them can go. That's awesome. Another thing that's great about it is just like the transport they developed, they didn't go cheap. I see, especially in developing countries, what you see in uh, lower income neighborhoods is that they, they put the old technology and the old resources in the poorer neighborhoods. Hey, it's better than nothing. So like in Santiago where I live, it's common that in the, in the nice parts of the city you have the nicer buses. The bad parts of the city have the old buses that the other part of the city used to have. That's not what they did in Medellin. They put better mobility infrastructure than existed anywhere else in the city. They put the nicest library in the whole country in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the whole city, in, in the city. So why does that matter? Is it created pride in community. And it also has brought wealthy people and tourists to poor neighborhoods in Medellin. And so it's a radical transformation that they've done by co-creating solutions with lower income people. This is happening closer to where I live in Concepcion in Chile. An interesting project with the World Bank and uh, the Ministry of Transportation. And the idea was to co-create new solutions to mobility challenges in Concepcion. So they did this sort of crowdsourcing ideas, this open innovation idea. They did it over a series of months with uh, uh, open data, but also just with open ideas. And so people coming and pitching ideas to these uh, different stakeholders. And then the World Bank is helping to fund pilot projects in these areas. One just kind of small example of the kind of thing that came out of this was uh, some people, and this is why it's so important to co-create. Governments don't always recognize all the problems. So somebody recognized that sometimes when somebody has a heart problem and they live in a rural community, uh, they don't have a direct address in a lot of the rural communities in Chile. They don't have a specific street address, like lot four, region seven. And so the ambulance has always had a very hard time getting to those people. So they, designed, they, they proposed a service that would facilitate the GPS coordination of the cell phone call that would be delivered straight to the ambulance while they're on the way to pick up these people. Good example why co-creation matters in cities, because they can solve real problems. I mentioned civic entrepreneurs. This is an area of, of real interest for me, uh, and it's a real growing area of entrepreneurship in the world. That is, again, entrepreneurs looking to solve civic problems. So this guy, Nigel Jacob, in Boston, co-founded this thing called the New Urban Mechanics, which is a city-sponsored initiative. It's a city-run initiative out of the mayor's office. What do they do? Entrepreneurs, civic entrepreneurs, with ideas to solve certain city problems, present their ideas to this office. If the office likes it, they help incubate and accelerate the project, help them test their idea in a part of the city. If it works, they help them scale the idea in the city. And then they go one more step. They say, we're going to help you get access to other cities. So they've been creating a network of other cities that are interested in this model. And so if, if it works in Boston, we'll help you get access to the people in Philadelphia. I mentioned procurement for innovation. It's another area of interest to me. This public policy tools for su supporting sustainable innovation. This is a paper I published earlier this year. 
uh, in a journal called Technovation. And what we looked at were different policy tools that local governments can use to stimulate sustainable technology over the life of the technology. So that's the S curve there. And so when you're at the early stage and you don't have proof of concept yet, we suggest a procurement for innovation model. I'll explain in the next slide a little bit more what I mean by procurement for innovation. Then we say as it's starting to get traction, that technology, you can use voluntary standards. So for example, Vancouver uh, in around 2001, 2002 was the first city in the world to require that all public buildings had to be built to a LEED gold green building standard. That's a voluntary thing in the public sector. It was, well, it was, it was mandatory in the public sector and voluntary in the private. But what they did with this policy, besides transforming their buildings to be green, was they also helped to facilitate the growth of the green building industry in Vancouver, which to this day is one of the most active green building communities in the world. So they have architects, engineers that do uh, energy modeling, they have product developers that make uh, renewable or products with renewable energies or, or green products. So they've created a whole industry by encouraging greener development. And then you have regulation. So for example, in Barcelona in 2000, 2001, they created uh, the world's first solar thermal ordinance, which required that all buildings over a certain size had to have a percentage of their hot water heated with photovoltaic panels. Same idea, same result. Grows the local industry, the local expertise. That same ordinance was then adopted by 50 other cities in, in Spain and has been adopted throughout Europe. I don't know if there are any cities in Portugal, but there probably are. So here's a tangible example going back to Barcelona of procurement for innovation. They had six challenges that they used this platform called CityMart, which in itself is a civic venture. CityMart is a platform to connect cities with technology providers uh, that are looking to solve sustainability or smart challenges in their city. So Barcelona, um, six challenges, they put a range for the budget, but they don't predetermine the outcome. They don't say we want these specifications in the solution. They say here's our problem, we want innovative solutions to our problem. They use this public platform that goes out to the world and it allows them to create sort of a, a crowdsourced innovation for their challenges in their city. Very different way of thinking about procurement. Most cities are still thinking of procurement as we need 12 seats for this aisle right here, and this is the size because this is the width of the aisle. It's a different way of thinking. How can we use our procurement budget to facilitate innovation in how we do things in our city? I talked about innovation districts already. I think they're a very interesting part of the larger puzzle here. This is an example in uh, Argentina. They used, in, our, in Buenos Aires, they have like five of these innovation districts with different uh, focal areas. This is their tech district, but they have one for uh, fashion, for example, because in Buenos Aires, there's a lot of fashion businesses. And so they're using this concept to regenerate poorer parts of the city and, and bring investment into the city and encourage more entrepreneurial action. So this is sort of my final trend, which leads into a proposal for this region, sharing cities. We've heard some talk about Uber today, um, Airbnb is another example, but there's a lot more. Bike sharing, actually I did a project recently, we identified 18 types of sharing activities that are already happening in cities right now that have a direct impact on sustainable development in the city. So this is happening across the board. I'll give some, some other examples. But this model is not mine. There's a guy named Jeremiah Oyang, who's a sort of world leading uh, thought leader in the space of sharing economy. He created this, what he calls the honeycomb model, which looks at sharing economy and money, things like crowdfunding, sharing economy and goods, things like how people can share products and services with each other, uh, food, which sounds kind of weird, but there's some cool business models around sharing food. Services, transportation, and space, like Airbnb. Uh, the most important book to date about the sharing economy is What's Mine is Yours on the left. 
And this guy beat me to it because I would have liked to write a book about sharing cities, but his is already coming out, so I'm not going to write one about it. Uh, 2015, it comes out, Sharing Cities. So two cities in the world right now have established early leadership as being pioneers in the sharing cities arena. Seoul, South Korea, set a goal to be the world capital of the sharing economy. And Amsterdam has now made the decision to try to be the leader in the region of Europe in the sharing economy. Examples of things they're doing in Seoul, there's a lot. These are just a few. Um, this, this thing here on the bottom with the suit is people can um, donate suits to a, basically a store for lower income people who want to find a job can go and borrow a suit for a few days and bring it back. Um, but there's so much more. That's a hackathon they were promoting. But there's a lot of other things they're doing. They have a lending library for tools. So in different parts of the city, if you need to repair your, something in your house, instead of having to go to the hardware store and buy those tools you're going to need once, you can go and borrow them from a lending library of tools. They've also done something really cool with their public buildings. They took an inventory of all the public buildings in Seoul, South Korea, and said, Let's, let's track the usage of these buildings for our needs. And not surprisingly, virtually every building after like six or seven at night is totally empty. On the weekends, totally empty. Underutilized resources, what have they done? They put them into a pool and allow organizations, community groups, entrepreneurs to gain access to those buildings for free during off time when offices are not running. They've also opened up a lot of uh, databases for trying to uh, promote use of, uh, of the open data to create platforms and mobile applications for citizens. They've also created an accelerator for sharing economy startups. They recognize that they're a very dense city, they have problems with the environment, and they also have um, a lot of smartphones. As we found out, so do you. So with all these smartphones, you can also have all kinds of location-based access to information about where you might be able to get a product or service or a ride to go where you need to go using your smartphone. So they're promoting and have funding to start, uh, fund startups in that space. This is Amsterdam. This is a map of their sharing economy. They're doing a lot in the space here in Europe. They're the leader at the moment in, in Europe. I talked about this idea of of creating uh, uh, local communities that actually co-invest in their own energy. There's an example in Vienna as well. They have something called Citizen Solar, where citizens can invest in solar projects in their city because Vienna has set a goal by 2050 that 50% of all their energy be renewable. So they wanted their citizens to participate and be co-investors in that. Now I'm getting closer to my proposal for this read. It's just an idea. Uh, Incredible edible. This is a new concept that's sort of growing around the globe, this idea of edible communities. So you've probably all heard of community gardens where people can uh, collaborate in the cultivation of local produce and sometimes share that produce or you have your own little part, you can make your own or grow your own tomatoes. This edible communities idea has gone way further and they try to create as much of the green space in a city to be edible as possible. So if you're going to plant trees, why not plant fruit trees? And where you have green space, why not plant uh, fruits and vegetables? And then anybody who lives or travels by in any of these communities can pick and eat anything they want. This is real. This is happening. Portugal's already participating in the sharing economy. Uh, when I came here, I arrived in Oporto uh, two days ago. And the day before, actually, Vitor said, hey, Boyd, here's where uh, Rob Adams is staying. Here's his hotel. Why don't you stay there? I looked at it. It looked like a nice hotel. But I love the sharing economy. And so I said, so I'm going to see what I can find on Airbnb. I know in a tourism event, this doesn't always go over very well, because if there are hotel operators in the room, they don't like hearing about Airbnb. We can talk about that. So I did a search, and here were some of the places available when I came. 
I ended up staying at that one right there, the top left one. Very nice. It was actually about four blocks from Rob's uh, hotel. But there's more. This is Airbnb closer to where we are now. There are options here. You know on Airbnb you can rent a castle? You can rent anything. You can rent a bed, a couch, a house. So here, closer to our region, uh, there are places available right now to stay at on Airbnb. This another thing that's cool, and this really gets, I think, interesting for the region maybe. This organization called HelpX, there's a lot of these like that. They promote sort of a volunteer tourism where you as an individual can go, you can look on a map, say I want to go to Australia. You click on Australia and you open up a map like this, which was my map for Portugal, and these are all opportunities where you can go and work for a few hours a day and not pay for your hotel. If you work even longer, you don't pay for your food. So, you see one right there. There it is. Terra de Sonos. I spoke with them by email. This is happening already in your community. So, they're building an eco-lodge near here, and their idea is using this sharing economy concept to co-construct this eco-village with tourists that come through the region, and they can stay with them for one day or 20 days, and depending on how many hours a week, how many hours a day they work, they get at least free housing, and if they work longer, they get free food too. So here's my proposal. To date, there is not one sharing region in the world that's recognized. There is not a region in the world that has come out with a public plan to become the leading sharing region in the world. When you think about the value of sharing region in a community like where we are now, you think about um, being able to do more with less resources. You think about lower environmental impact. You think about giving access to lower income people services and products they wouldn't normally get. And you think about maybe creating a unique brand for a unique type of tourist that wants to experience firsthand and not just go and buy um, uh, trinkets at a, at a gift store, but they actually want to participate. And think about the pride you could have as a visitor saying, I helped co-create this lodge. And I'm going to tell more people, but I'm going to tweet about that I helped create this. Look at that dome. I helped build that dome. So for me, for a region that wants to pursue sustainability, uh, there's already some action happening in the sharing economy, Airbnb, and HelpX are examples. Uh, I think it could be an interesting strategy that leverages technology, yes, platforms like HelpX, but also leverages a community spirit and creates a, an interesting dynamic. And again, it's not just for tourists. It could be community-based energy, like we talked about, like the Vienna example or SAMSO. So that's my proposal to you as, a, as something to think about. And now we're going to open it up for a few questions. Thank you.